All right. So we're taking a look at the Nuremberg trials by history scope. Okay. So I am going to try to, <laughs> we're going to react to this video basically. And we're going to look at some of the effects afterwards specifically about why officers have a duty to not follow orders that are, you know, um, just morally wrong. Okay. Uh, this video, I do not recommend you watch it with children. Um, there's going to be a lot of stuff that probably don't want them to know, but that's up to you. Um, there's going to be a lot of horrific stuff talked about here. So just so you are aware, if there is any, some, okay. If you make a comment and not, sympathizer in any way i'm just deleting it I, I could care less um make your comments intelligent we're talking about a very serious subject here don't do stupid things i have no patience for it this is youtube is not a freedom of speech place um and they give me full rights to do whatever i want in the comment section with that so that's what i'm going to do <clears throat> if i ask for comments I hopefully bring some intelligence with it and some sources would be very nice now let us continue the Nuremberg Trials saw the end of a regime that caused the Holocaust, and it was the first time in history where an international court sentenced people to prison and to death. It would later set the stage for an international court of justice, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and two Geneva Conventions. Germany started the Second World War when it invaded Poland, and eventually attacked over half a dozen countries throughout the continent. But by 1943 the tide of war had turned, the Soviet Union was beginning to push back at Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad. While the British, meanwhile, had beaten back the German air raids and pushed the Axis powers out of Africa. So the leaders of the major Allied powers came together to discuss the state of the world after World War II had ended. Stalin of the Soviet Union, Roosevelt of the USA, and Churchill of the United Kingdom discussed creating the United Nations, the D-Day invasions, and dividing Germany up into four occupation zones. Because Germany will be divided. But that was not all. Over the course of World War II, it became apparent that Germany committed atrocities on a massive scale. The night raids, the forced deportations, the mass genocide. There was only one question on everybody's mind. How do you punish acts that are this evil? To this question, there were basically only three answers. The first was to do nothing. To let all the atrocities, all the death, all the destruction go unpunished. But how could any country consent to such a course of action? And they couldn't. It's just very simple. They couldn't. There was no precedent at all for any legal basis against any of these crimes. If they were legal in Germany, they were legal. Okay, there was no international court. There was no international tribunal. None of that stuff existed. The UN didn't exist. So there was no legal legal system that existed before World War II to punish these. But they're going to create one to do so because this is just horrific what they did to their own people. How could the far-off USA, the invaded Soviet Union, or the occupied Czechoslovakia consent to such a course of action? And not just the German people, really all people. Sexuals, Jews, gypsies, disabled, gay, everyone. The second option was to put all the perpetrators to death through executive action, to simply give the command to kill thousands of people, regardless of whether they committed any war crimes or not. But this action was disliked by both Roosevelt and Churchill at the time. Okay, the Soviets would be perfectly willing to do this. Um, oh, for God's sake, they did it to their own people. I'm not going to sit here and defend the Soviet Union for a minute. Um, but we in the West, the democratic nations of the world, not just you know the West, the democratic nations of the world, just sentencing somebody to die is a very hard thing to do. So. And so eventually, by the end of the war, a third option was chosen. Justice through persecution. It was decided that the perpetrators of the Second World War and of the Holocaust would be dealt a fairness and justice that they themselves destroyed in Germany. But that brought up the next question. How do you punish someone from another sovereign country for crimes that are not actually illegal in that country? The Allied powers answered this question with the London Charter of the International Military Tribunal. 
This charter laid out a system where four different legal codes of France, the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom would be incorporated into a single tribunal. There were prosecutors and defense attorneys, according to British and US laws, but decisions and sentences were imposed by a group of judges, according to French and Soviet legislation. Furthermore, four types of crimes were determined that a person could be indicted for. The first is... Again, this is something that they had to come up with basically just before the trials. It did not exist, but they are making it exist at this time Be for the horrific crimes that uh, the Nazis really did. Crimes against peace, which included planning, initiating, and waging wars of aggression, or wars in violation of international treaties. The second is crimes against humanity, such as extermination, deportation, and genocide. The third is war crimes. This basically meant a violation of the rules of war that were set before the Second World War, such as executing prisoners. The fourth- Basically everything that was in the Geneva Convention that was signed by all parties um, would be constituted as a war crime if they were not followed, which, fun fact, basically every nation did war crimes in World War II. The fourth crime is a common plan or conspiracy to commit any of the three aforementioned crimes. After all, Simply because you didn't put anyone in the gas chambers yourself doesn't mean you're not guilty of creating the system leading to such genocide. It would be conspiracy is I'm not sure at the time, but the United States is one of the only few countries left that you can get a conspiracy charge, conspiracy to robbery, conspiracy to spy, conspiracy to hijack a plane, conspiracy. It is a very legally iffy definition, okay? Um Larry Lawton you know who he is talks about this and conspiracy and they not going to defend anything these people did and they rightfully should get conspiracy charges on that but conspiracy is a very legally legally dubious thing again these rest of these things make sense after all simply because you didn't put anyone in the gas chambers yourself doesn't mean you're not guilty of creating the system leading to such genocide and that's what they would defi define as conspiracy back then which makes sense. It would be possible for someone to be indicted for any or all of these crimes. For example, Wilhelm Keitel, who was the de facto head of the German military during the war, was indicted for all four crimes. He was found guilty on all four charges at the Nuremberg trial and sentenced to death. Or take the case of Julius Streicher, publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper. He was only indicted for conspiracy and crimes against humanity and he would only be found guilty of the latter, although he too would be sentenced to death for that crime. Again, conspiracy charges, the conspiracy to basically do something is a lot, it's a lot easier to prove, okay. In a court of law, like beyond a reasonable doubt, okay, there are different stages of um, legality or not legality, uh, measures you have to get to. So beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest possible charge so, for example, if you murder somebody and beyond a reasonable doubt you did it, um, you can be convicted. If there's anything less than that, you there is muddy, you can be acquitted, okay? Um, and they were unable to prove, or at least it seems they were unable to prove crime, crimes against humanity for him. But the conspiracy um, of running his newspapers, which was anti-Semitic completely, um, um, and it's... Basically everything it did, so it makes sense that way. ...and crimes against humanity, and he would only be found guilty of the latter, although he too would be sentenced to death for that crime. It is important to know... And remember, everyone at Nuremberg was a piece of shit. <laughs> this is for the highest members of the Nazi party. This isn't for some low-level guys. This is for the absolute highest um, people that perpetrated everything. Note that this is not the only trial. There were several others, such as the doctor's trial and the judge's trial. The Nuremberg trial, however, was only for the worst offenders. Those who had created the system of oppression and extermination in Germany and its occupying territories. One of such worst offenders is Wilhelm Frick, Minister of the Interior and co-author of anti-Semitic laws imposed in Germany before the war. Or Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the highest ranking SS officer tried at Nuremberg and Chief of the Intelligence, Gestapo, and Criminal Police. Both of them would be found guilty, and both of them would be sentenced to death. In total, 24 men would be indicted at the trial, 
Of these 24, there are three special cases we need to discuss first. First is Martin Bormann, who was party secretary. He was absent at the trial. He would be found guilty and sentenced to death in absentia. However, it would be discovered in 1972 that he had actually died a few days before the war had ended, but his body wasn't identified before then. There's also the case of Gustav Krupp von Bohlen und Halba. Kind of wonder how the Martin Bormann trial went because he's not present. I guess his lawyer defended him, but he wasn't present and they sentenced him to death. I mean, ab an absentia would basically means if we find you, you're dead, but he'd already died. Kind of wonder how that one was. A major industrialist. He was found medically unfit for trial and passed away in 1950 without sentencing. And thirdly is the case of Rob and the medically unfit thing. Um, we kind of don't do that anymore legally. Um, you either did or didn't. I guess you could try to get sentenced to an insane asylum, but it is very hard to do that today. Um, whereas back then, if you were old, you were going to die or you're senile anyway, it was a lot easier to basically just not get sentenced. Found medically unfit for trial and passed away in 1950 without sentencing. And thirdly is the case of Robert Ley, head of the German trade unions. He believed that, as the loser in the war, he ought to just be shot rather than to be brought before a tribunal like a criminal. Ley therefore strangled himself in his cell three days after receiving his indictment. The trial was now almost ready to begin. And this kind of makes sense. He's, I mean, he's SS, so... He lost the war. I mean, at this point, he already knows he's one of the worst. He already knows he's going to die. He's going to kill himself either. I mean, he's going to kill himself. He's like, why should we go through this charade to kill you, to basically die? But what we are trying to set at this legal precedent is being like, this is cross the line. We are setting down the international laws that if you do any X, Y, and Z things from now, from what, you, what previously happened in World War II, and from now on into infinity... You can be tried for these crimes, and that's what the legal precedent is, and you still have a legal right to defend yourself. The trial was now almost ready to begin. The war was over, the men had been captured, and the crimes were determined. But there was one more obstacle to overcome before the trial could commence, and that was the problem of language. This trial was held between French, English, Russian, and German speakers. How were they going to communicate efficiently with each other? IBM came up with a brilliant system that we still use today, simultaneous interpretation. This is the technique where interpreters translate what is being said while it is being said, and then everybody can listen to the translation in their own native language directly via headphones. This is how, for example, the United Nations and the European Parliament work today. Now it was... Yep, and we got that. Uh, IBM did that for Nuremberg, so and then now we have it for really all um, national meetings that you need to have it for, basically. Time for the trial to commence. Each of the four countries provided a prosecutor and a team of experts behind them. The defendants were entitled to receive a copy of the indictment made against them, any relevant explanation about the indictments, and to be represented by a lawyer of their choice. And of course, the defendants chose the best German lawyers they could possibly find. To give an example of how good these lawyers are, Let's look at the case of Admiral Karl Dönitz, head of the German Navy from 1943 onward. He was indicted because he had ordered his submarines not to help the survivors of any sinking ship, instead letting them drown in the Atlantic Ocean. This was in clear violation of the Second London Naval Treaty. His lawyer, however, would save his life. He presented evidence that the USA had committed the exact same breach of the treaty in the Pacific in its war with Japan, and argued that Dönitz should not be convicted for a crime the USA also committed. And it worked. Karl Dönitz was sentenced to only 10 years in prison. He was released in 1956 and died in 1980. When The German Navy, the Kriegsmarine of the branches of service in World War II in Nazi Germany were the least Nazified. I'm confident in saying that. Um, they had a lot higher education because, again, this is the Navy. It's not, you have to have a lot of technical skills to do this job. Um, 
And yeah, they were at least Nazi fight. Okay, another thing to mention that not only did the USA do this against Japanese, the whole point of the second London Naval Charter, which is what they are talking about by not saving people. Okay. The reason he was appointed admiral in 1943 of basically the entire German uh, Navy at this point, because Eric Rader lost his job. German subs up to around 42, I believe, um, did in fact surface and try to help um, ships that were sunk. This happened specifically in the Mediterranean. Okay. They sank, uh, I believe, a British ship. Um, they surfaced to save them because they, again, morally is the right thing to do. However, they were then bombed by the British, so they had to submerge. And again, this keeps happening, and ships, again, it's very dangerous to surface in a submarine to help people in the water. As, as, as shitty as that sounds, it is very dangerous, and they did try to do it in the beginning. Karl Dönitz was sentenced to only 10 years in prison. He was released in 1956 and died in 1980. When the trial first started, prosecution was afraid there wouldn't be any evidence that these men were responsible for the atrocities committed during the war. But they forgot the German character. The Germans documented everything. 47 crates of binders, 1400 kilograms of party records, and kilometers of film poured in. This is something that will help in Nuremberg. However, the Tokyo trials, which come after this, the Japanese military burned basically everything they could possibly get their hands on because they did horrific war crimes. And again, we don't even know the full extent today because they burned basically every record that they possibly kept to prevent this. Therefore, the prosecution decided not to go directly after the greater atrocities of World War II. Instead, they wanted to lay bare the system of conspiracy that would slowly lead to the Second World War and the atrocities committed in them. They wanted to prove that it was these men who created the system that would lead to these atrocities. From the supposed need for breathing room to feed the German people, to the aspiration of the extermination of what they considered an undesirable population. The prosecution pulled out one incriminating document after another, such as a document that showed how they were planning to start a war by whatever means necessary. It is my unalterable decision to squash Czechoslovakia by military means in the near future. It is the job of the political leaders to bring about the military and politically suitable moment. Yeah, um, they had a lot of criminal and damning evidence that, again, they were going to go to war no matter what. I've actually seen a few comments, if you can believe it or not, um, that say Poland was... Poland wasn't supposed to go to war with Germany and they could have been avoided. No, Germany was going to go to war with Poland either way. Whether they give up Danzig or not, they find another way to do it. The primary defense of these actions was that they were only made illegal after the crimes had been committed. But the prosecution countered by stating that the first person to be sentenced for murder could just as easily have argued that nobody had ever been sentenced for murder, so why should they? And that's a reasonable argument for both sides. Side one says his defense basically says that it's not been law, it shouldn't be a thing. And the prosecution argues that just because just because murder wasn't illegal before the first murder happened, doesn't mean you shouldn't be held accountable for murder. Okay, both arguments make very valid sense. They argued that some crimes are so universally immoral that it shouldn't require a precedent. Now that is true. You can't just to say that, well, just because I gassed a whole bunch of Jews and killed a whole bunch of people, uh, mothers and children, um, because it wasn't illegal, it shouldn't be illegal. No, there are some crimes that are just straight morally wrong. Regardless of your religion, there are just straight crimes that you know in your heart are you cannot commit. You can't just do them because they're morally wrong. Like, you can't just go kill people for no reason. It, it, it doesn't <laughs> morally... You just, you know you shouldn't do it. ...are so universally immoral that it shouldn't require a precedent. One of the defendants, Albert Speer, realized that the prosecution, the Allied powers, and the judges wanted to hear an apology, an admission of wrongdoing, an expression of repentance. And so he simply gave them one. He took personal responsibility for the crimes he and his country had committed. While Speer was responsible for ordering the use of hundreds of thousands of slave laborers, 
He himself was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. And he also did not pass on the order to basically obliterate Germany from Hitler. He, at that point, uh, I think there's a downfall scene in that movie, which he basically says, I didn't pass on the order. Um, maybe that helped him out. I'm not sure. He was released in 1966 and died in 1981. Now that the prosecution had presented that there was indeed a common conspiracy against peace and certain types of people, they continued with the greater atrocities of the war. They showed a documentary about the concentration camps, which I will not show here because I do not want any of my audience to involuntarily see the horrific acts depicted in them. I will also not show that. It is on Wikipedia. Um, it is quite horrific if you are not used to that it may very well make very disturb you and vomit um if you can stomach it then it is there on wikipedia for you to again the videos are there um, and i have seen them and they are truly horrific for what they did if you do want to see the evidence it is available on the english wikipedia page on the nuremberg trials and i will leave a link in the description this film showed the horrors of the concentration camps the piles of bodies the gas chambers, the unimaginable suffering. People in the courtroom cried. Some even fainted. The defense of these men on trial could largely be summed up as, I was just following orders. The prosecution deconstructed that argument, stating that men who commit crimes cannot plea as a defense that they committed them in uniform. Military men are not above and beyond the moral requirements that apply to others, incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own. They pointed out that another German general, Erwin Rommel, had been ordered to kill any commandos that he had or would capture. But Rommel had burned the order, showing that even a high-ranking general was able to exercise moral judgment and disobey immoral orders. As the trial... And this is something that I'm going to show you in a minute that this still applies today. Men who commit these crimes cannot play as a defense that they committed them in uniform. Being in uniform does not absolve you of the horrific crimes that you have done. Um, if you receive an illegal order, you have a duty to not follow it. it. You can't just, you can't follow an illegal order. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Military men are not above and beyond the moral and legal requirements that apply to others. Incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own. They are not. Okay, um, Rommel did burn the order of the killing the commandos. Okay, and this is an order, I believe, ordered by Hitler um, to kill basically commandos. Um, so British has to yes, anybody captured behind the lines. Um, and I'm going to show you now that again, military men are not above this requirement, at least from the USA side. Okay, so again, this is a uniform United States Armed Forces oath of enlistment. Okay, I want to talk about the officer one in a minute. Um, just so you know, this one has been changed, but it hasn't been changed in 66. And I unfortunately do not know what the original one was, um, but, so, I will read it verbatim. I, so Conrad, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same, and I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. This part right here of the officers appointed over me, okay? Um, and the all, and the orders of the officers appointed over me, okay? And let me read you something else. This, I was um, talking with one of my uh, officer friends that I know. So they take a different oath. And when I read it to you, I, in this case, Conrad, do solemnly swear that I support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of, of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. Nowhere in this specific text for the officers does it say you will obey the orders of the officers appointed over you. If they give you an immoral, immoral order, it is your duty to not follow that order, okay? The enlisted one is a little different, but again, they are taught, again, any veterans can, can point to this. You are taught that if you receive an illegal order, you are not to follow it. Um, and a lot of this came out of specifically the Nuremberg trials because of the, of, because basically of the defense that I, I didn't do it. Somebody ordered, ordered me to do it. 
we now basically most um, Western countries um, that are in NATO basically say that and teach you that you can't just follow orders um, blindly. Um, if they're immoral, you have an obligation to not follow them. And this this is basically straight out of from Nuremberg is where we get a lot of that changes. Was able to exercise moral judgment and disobey immoral orders. As the trial progressed, a very curious case became clear, that of Hjalmar Schacht. Schacht was a prominent banker and economist in Germany, having served as president of the central bank and economics minister. While an important figure before the war, he had lost all his power by the time it started, and had even been in contact with resistance leaders until he himself was put in a concentration camp. In the end, he was acquitted and set free and would go on advising developing countries on matters of finance and economics. When he was acquitted, you have to remember that this trial was not a trial by peers, okay? It was not a trial by jury either. It was just a straight, are you guilty according to the judges? That's it. There was no jury. There was no jury by peers. It was straight just the, the judges on what they thought um, should be the punishment. Prosecutor and defense, obviously, um, but again, just straight up to the judges. Now that is seems a lot more is a lot more of a European thing than it is in the United States. Again, in the United States, basically, if you go to trial for any crime, um, even in the arm, uniformed armed services, you are given a trial by your peers. Um, your peers in the civilian world is basically everyone, and in uh, the military, it depends if you're enlisted or officer. If you're enlisted, it can either be enlisted peers or only officers and if you're officer it's only officers that will judge you um but you are you have a jury um but in these in this specific case for the nuremberg trials and, and also the tokyo trials that that's not the case and passed away in 1970. by now all the evidence had been presented and the accused had been given the opportunity to defend themselves it was now time to pass judgment it took the judges two days to determine the sentences of these 24 men. Before we continue, I want to point out something. Nuremberg will be the basis of the Tokyo trial. They will use what is set, the precedent set at Nuremberg for the Tokyo trial. And this will actually lead to a lot of judges, especially the Indian judge, um, saying he, he couldn't render a verdict. And the Dutch one eventually doing somewhat of the same thing. Kind of, but not to the same extent as the Indian judge. Um, but Nuremberg is a precedent from basically all international um, war crimes tribunals that we get everything from. Twelve were sentenced to death by hanging, seven were sent to prison, three were acquitted, and two were left without a decision. Of those men sentenced to death who have not yet been named in this video are Hans Frank, Governor General of Occupied Poland. Should have been sentenced to death. I agree with everything that happened. The governor, <laughs> what he did in Poland is truly horrific for what he did. Alfred Jodl, a general in the German military who signed the summary execution of the Allied commandos and Soviet commissars. Joachim von der Ribbentrop, ambassador to the UK and later minister of foreign affairs. So again, Jodl basically just broke uh, international precedent and he was sentenced to death. And he ha there was a precedent set before World War II, and he broke it. Von der Ribbentrop, ambassador to the UK and later Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was responsible for a treaty that divided Poland up between Germany and the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, he's also an SS man, and he was not very good diplomat at all. But this treaty that divides up the USS uh, Poland between the Germans and the USSR, you're going to see something very familiar here. Uh... Nobody in the United USSR, the, the the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, was ever prosecuted in any any tribunal whatsoever for anything that happened in Eastern Poland. Didn't happen. Um, Ribbentrop was, but he also did a lot of horrific things on top of that, on top of just the Molotov Ribbentrop Act and the Soviet Union. Alfred Rosenberg, Minister of Eastern Occupied Territories. I don't think I need to explain to you what horrific things went on in the Eastern Territories. Again, sentenced to death. Pi territories. Fritz Sauko, head of the slave labor program. Arthur Sees Inquart, commander of the occupied Netherlands. And Hermann Göring. We'll come back to him in a little bit. The men sentenced to prison who have not yet been named. Walter Funk, 
Minister of Economics, and sentenced to life imprisonment, but released due to ill health in 1957. You will be hearing a lot of that from now on, from ill health. Basically, they let you out if you were about to die. And passed away in 1960. Konstantin von Neurat, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Reich Protector of Bohemia and Morovia, had resigned in 1943, sentenced to 15 years in prison, but released in 1954 due to ill health, and passed away in 1956. Erich Reder, Commander-in-Chief of the German Navy until his retirement in 1943, sentenced to life imprisonment, but released in 1955 due to ill health, and passed away in 1960. Baldur von Schirach, head of the party's youth division until 1940, sentenced to 20 years in prison and passed away in 1974. And Rudolf Hess, we'll also get back to him later. Out of the three men who were acquitted, there was the previously named Schacht, but also Hans Fritze, a popular radio commentator and head of the news division of the propaganda ministry. His crimes were not deemed severe enough for this tribunal, and he would later be sentenced to nine years in prison at a different trial. He would be released in 1950 due to ill health, and died in 1953. And there is Franz von Papen. He served as the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor of Germany, was an ambassador to Austria and later Turkey. He was acquitted at Nuremberg, However, he would later be sentenced to eight years in prison for his actions during the war. Not only, okay, Von Poppen, again, I keep referring to this gospel book, the Weimar Republic source book. He's in here, okay? He, <laughs> he is a person that always played in the shadows. He never wanted to be chancellor, at least in the Weimar Republic, which he was. Um, he always wanted to operate in the shadows, and everything he did, again, they, they couldn't prosecute him at Nuremberg for what he did, but they sentenced him to a lower court. He's not exactly... I stand by what they said. I'll just put it that way. He was an ambassador to Austria and later Turkey. He was acquitted at Nuremberg. However, he would later be sentenced to eight years in prison for his actions during the war. He appealed that decision and was once again acquitted after serving only two years in prison and passed away in 1969. It kind of makes sense. I'm not 100% positive on Juan Poppin. I can tell you what he did in the Weimar Republic... In the Weimar Republic, not any of this trial, he was not directly responsible for a lot of the things that led to the Nazi party taking power. Well, I say that, but he kind of was instrumental in being an idiot and letting it happen, so... The hangings of those sentenced to death would take place two weeks later. Hermann Göring, the highest-ranking man on trial, took one last act of defiance by committing suicide. He was commander of the Air Force, de facto head of the economy, and the original head of the Gestapo. He was also um, deputy Reichsfuhrer, so right under Hitler, um, before he was removed from that position too. He was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to death. The hangings were supposed to be done via the standard drop method, where the goal is to break the neck so the person dies instantly instead of suffering a slow strangulation. But some of the hangings were botched and took several minutes of strangulation before they died. Von Ribbentrop took 17 minutes to die, Jodl 18, and Keidel 28. The bodies were then cremated and the ashes dumped into the river. The last one of these men to die was Rudolf Hess. He flew to Scotland in 19. There is a whole movie, if I remember correctly, about the Americans, you know, we botched things. And the, uh, there's an English um, executioner that was called in to do it more efficiently for lower criminals, if I remember correctly. And it was after Nuremberg. There's a movie about it. Hess. He flew to Scotland in 1941 to negotiate a peace treaty with the British, but was instead imprisoned. Thus, he didn't participate in many of the atrocities. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and died in 1987 when he strangled himself at the age of 93. You may ask why, if he was in 41 captured, um, and he just didn't participate um, from 41 to 45, why he's even here. It's very simple. He was deputy of the Reichsfuhrer, okay? Um, and he was from 33, basically Hitler's deputy Fuhrer from 33 until, again, 41 when he did this. He was insane at the time. Um, there's a lot that goes on there. But um, he helped Hitler do horrific things from 33 till 41 and that is why he was con you know, convicted here 
The prison was the model. Or sorry, not convicted here, but he was, you know, in prison in the United Kingdom um, from 41 to the end. He flew to Scotland in 1941 to negotiate a peace treaty with the British, but was instead imprisoned. Thus, he didn't participate in many of the atrocities. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and died in 1987 when he strangled himself at the age of 93. The prison was demolished to prevent it from becoming a shrine to followers of that toxic ideology. But instead, his burial site became a destination for yearly pilgrimages by neo-Nazis. So when the lease on his burial site ended in 2011, his grave was reopened, his remains cremated, and his ashes scattered at the sea. There are still some fascist elements in Italy that actually go to Mussolini's uh, place that he was killed um, every year to do whatever stupid shit they, they feel like they want to do there. Um... And so ended the regime that started the Second World War in Europe, committed genocide with a brutality rarely seen in history, and took the lives of 50 to 56 million people. This video was only a summary of the Nuremberg Trials. I had to leave out many things, such as the fact that the Soviet Union committed many of the same atrocities, but were not put on trial. They were not put on trial at all. Uh, they did absolutely horrific things in the in Poland, the Kachin Massacre. Uh, they did a, a lot of horrific things in the East. Talk to any Baltic nation. Um, Arthur Ray, if you know him, he talks about it, um, where his you know granddad was deported. There's a lot of horrific stuff the Soviet Union did, but they were not charged with anything because they were seen as a ally. And that ally lasted until uh, 46, and then we became enemies. So, Or why Nuremberg was chosen as the location. Therefore, if you're interested... In if I remember correctly... Wow, I just I got through this. Nuremberg, it was the, re the reason it was at Nuremberg was because that was where the first Jewish anti-Semitic laws were established, was at Nuremberg. So, if I remember correctly, that is why they chose Nuremberg um, as a sticking pin, basically. The first Jewish anti-Semitic laws came out of Nuremberg, so they're going to do it there um, as a spite to them. Reading more about the topic. As a spite to the Nazi party. I will provide a few sources down below where you can learn more about the subject. If you like this video... I will also put those sources down there um, from his video. Again, you should go watch the original video. The links are there. And I'll also put all of his links in the bottom of this description video, please give it a thumbs up and press the subscribe button. My next video will finish the series on the Tulip Mania. And I um, go watch. And again, uh, the original videos in the description, so you can go like it and subscribe there. After that, I will start a new series on the Aztec Empire. If you want to see those and other videos as soon as they come out, press the subscribe button. Um, and we'll leave the video there. I will react to the Tokyo Trials um, and give my opinion there. But it is important to base uh, the Tokyo trials. You need to know about the Nuremberg trials to be fully um, be able to articulate basically the Tokyo trials of what happened there. So hope you guys like this video. Uh, well, I won't say even hopefully like this video. I hope this video was informative rather than anything else. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Um, again, all the links to everything that happened are going to be in the description. Do not click them if you are queasy on any sort. Okay but they are an important fact of history that should be remembered.